religion. Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue attacked in October. Chabad of Poway yesterday or Saturday in San Diego. Christians at Easter services in Sri Lanka. Muslims in Christchurch, New Zealand. It is a non-denominational or all-denomination hatred that we're dealing with. The Hugh Hewitt Show. Weekday mornings at 6, right before Mike Gallagher at 9 on AM 1250. The Answer. I am a measles survivor. That's right. I grew up in a time a long, long time ago when we didn't have cable TV or cell phones or social media, but we had measles. Everybody got the measles. All four of my siblings got them. Uh, or it. I don't know. Was it me? Is it them or it? I, we, we called them them, the, the measles. They were plural because they were a rash, and I guess each splotch on your skin was a measle. So they were the measles, but that's what they were called. And you got them. You didn't get it. Uh, Every one of my friends got them, and we did call them them, as I said. And it was nothing, so I'm having a little trouble understanding the panic right now. Uh, I do get that people would be annoyed by other people who refuse to be vaccinated for measles and now are out there infecting people with a disease that we don't have to have because they have a a vaccination for it. But... um, your chances of dying, I mean, it, it's its not leprosy, okay? Your chances of dying are about the same as being struck by lightning. There's a cruise ship with 300 people in St. Lucia. There's a story about that out there on the Internet. And it's been quarantined because of one case of the measles on a gigantic ship. And they, they're not letting the ship, uh, I guess they're making it stay out at sea. To give you an idea of what a big deal the measles were a long time ago, Here's an episode from The Brady Bunch, one of the worst shows ever on television, by the way, but very popular. It includes a phone conversation here on a landline, of course, between Mr. and Mrs. Brady. Listen. Peter. What are you doing home from school? They sent me home. Measles. That's either measles or a strange case of red freckles. You have got a temperature. They told me. 101.1. What's the record? Never mind. Oh, are you sure it's the measles? Well, he certainly got all the symptoms. A slight temperature, a lot of dots, and a great big smile. A great big smile? No school for a few days. Say hello to my dotted son for me. Tell him I'll bring him some comic books and I'll see you later, dear. Okay, honey, bye. Boy, this is the life, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, if you have to get sick. Sure can't beat the measles. That's right. No medicine. Inside or out. Like shots, I mean. Don't even mention shots. Yeah! Well, that's really funny stuff, though, isn't it? And really good acting. Uh, It's almost, it's actually worse if you can see them when they're doing that kind of acting. Anyway, uh, I also had the mumps and the chicken pox and survived them both. And so I, I'm sorry, I, I don't get it. It's the measles. Uh, I know I, nobody wants to get them now because they're supposed to be, supposed to have been eradicated, but it's the measles, okay? Anyway, I survived and most people of my generation did. When we come back, we're not going to talk about the measles. Uh, we will talk about guns with a guy who's written about the role that guns have played in our history. He's written a book about it and what they could have been playing, what role they could have been playing in Venezuela right now. Stick around. Have you heard the crack of the bat, the cheers of the crowd? Have you seen the smiles on the faces of the players as they take the field? I'm not talking about the Pirates. I'm talking about what's happening in Moon Township that can only be described as a miracle. This is John Stagerwald. With the help of Pirates Charities and people like yourself, the Miracle League of Moon Township has broken ground on a brand new ball field and adaptive playground where athletes with special needs can play regardless of their ability. At miraclesinmoon.org, you can see the stunning plans for the 9,500-square-foot playground and state-of-the-art ADA-compliant restroom facility with showers, wave technology, multi-level fountains and sinks, mechanical changing tables, and more. It's incredible. Our goal? To raise the remaining funds they need to bring it home by first pitch this September. Check it out at miraclesinmoon.org slash donate and make your tax-deductible gift today. That's miraclesinmoon.org slash donate. 
This message paid for by Robinson Town Center, a Zamias Properties entity. Getting close to retirement? Experienced a nice Trumponomics bump in your portfolio? Well, we know the market goes up, and unfortunately, we also know it goes down. Don't risk your retirement to market whims. Learn how you can lock in those gains today by spending time with the team at Marley Financial. Todd Marley and the experts at Marley Financial can help you design a retirement plan that is bulletproof against the market's ups and downs. The team at Marley Financial uses a multitude of different techniques to make sure that you have a retirement plan that is tax-friendly, stable, and worry-free. Oh, and speaking of taxes, did you know that Marley Financial can handle that too? With all the changes in the tax laws, be sure you're taking advantage of the best possible deduction and make sure you know what adjustments to make for your overall financial picture going forward. Call today for a no-obligation consultation to see just how, for 25 years, the clients at Marley Financial have never had a retirement plan fail. Call 724-884-1496 today. 724-884-1496 for 1496 or visit them at marleyfg.com. Relief Factor is made from high-quality fish oil and essential nutrients. Gives your body the help it needs to aid fighting recurring aches and pains. When life's aches and pains get you down, you need relief. Physicians made Relief Factor as an essential way to support the body's fight against aches and pains. It's a remarkable product. It has worked. I only endorse it because it helped my wife with her knee pain. I didn't even know she was taking it. Then when it was mentioned, she said, oh yeah, this stuff is is like magic. Look, there are people who've told me they've postponed or delayed or simply negated surgery because of Relief Factor. That's how powerful it is. Go to www.relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com or call 800-500-8384. That's 800-500-8384. This remarkable product is called Relief Factor, relieffactor.com. If you take a look around your hometown, you might notice that there seems to be a mattress store on every corner, each with a different sale every weekend. Where do you start? And how do you know if you're actually getting a good value? Here at the Original Mattress Factory, what you see is what you get. You'll find our hand-built, high-quality mattresses at the same great price every day. Stop by one of our local factories or stores to experience the Original Mattress Factory difference. Great beds, no bull. The gimmicks, the flashy sales, and the big markups. Mattress stores have made the mattress shopping experience confusing on purpose. Ron Trzinski started the original mattress factory to create a better way. He raised the bar on quality, offered hand-built mattresses for a fraction of the cost, and ditched the high-pressure sales tactics, all to create a better mattress buying experience for you. You could say he was the original disruptor. Stop by an original mattress factory store or visit us at originalmattress.com to see the OMF difference for yourself. You're listening to The John Steigerwald Show on AM 1250, The Answer. Well, we are uh, waiting for our guest. We're having a little trouble connecting with uh, David Harsani. He's the uh, author of a book called First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. Uh, We hope to get him. If we don't, we don't. And uh, I have some other stuff here I was going to get to later. I'll go to it now, and that's called... uh, you know, filling time until we get them, or just uh, this stuff I wanted to get to anyway. The first thing was um, uh, CNN's ratings um, are, I mean, they're still going down. And here, here's the thing: I, I worked in, I worked in TV for a long time, and you know, people uh, survive or die in the television business based on ratings. You know. How many people are watching? And and I've been, I mean, I've been around a long time. I've been watching CNN. I remember when CNN came on the air and whatever it was, 1980, or maybe before that. I don't know. It was the late 70s, early 80s. It's been a long time. And it was a big deal. Ted Turner, you know, started it. And um, it was pretty impressive. I mean, it was a, it was somebody going to, that was going to do all news all the time, 24 hours a day on television, not radio. Radio was been, had been done for a long time. So they've been around a long time. And, but the thing is, I, I keep seeing the same people. I see the same people. I see Wolf Blitzer all the time. I see the same people on their air. And um, the, the people are not supposed to survive when your ratings continue to go in the toilet to this degree. Uh, it dropped 26% in April. That's huge. You don't you just don't drop that much uh, in ratings in one rating period. 
Um, and CNN is the lowest rated month in total viewers since October 2015. So they've been this, they've been this low before, but they came up. And what happened was when during the Mueller uh, fiasco and the hoax, they were um, declaring that Donald Trump was going to be uh, impeached at some time in the next five minutes. And it, they did it every night, all night. So did MSNBC, and their ratings went up because of it, because apparently there are people, obviously there are people out there who are hoping that this happens, and it was wishful thinking journalism going on. So uh, their ratings have gone in the toilet. Uh, in the 25 to 54-year-old demographic, that's the one that the advertisers uh, like the most, it was uh, the least watched, least watched month since August 2015. Now, Fox finished first, first with an average of 2.4 million viewers in April. Uh, the, they also averaged 2.4 um, in uh, 2018 in the same month, so they, they stayed the same. MSNBC was second. They averaged 1.66 million viewers, down from 1.93 in April. So they, they're off uh, about 300,000 people. That's a lot. Um, and CNN was third. They had 767,000 viewers, and that's down from 1.04 million last April. They dropped from 1.04 million to 767. This is what, when that happens, people show up uh, at the uh, at the studio at the offices, and they have real long faces. They're supposed to, and they should be looking around the corner to see if the boss is coming to tell them that they've been fired, or they might be looking around the corner to see if someone's coming to tell them that the boss has been fired because the ratings stink. But you don't survive. You just don't. You don't survive this kind of a, a, um, a trip into the toilet that uh, CNN has had. So I, I don't, I just, I don't get it. The top five shows in cable news, okay? And this has been going on forever. Fox H uh, Hannity was number one, three million viewers. Then was Tucker Carlson, Fox, with 2.8 million viewers. And then Rachel Maddow show, she was third with 2.3 million viewers. And then the Ingram Angle on Fox with 2.455. And then after that, the five with 2.4 million. That's four of the five top shows on ca in cable news were on Fox uh, again in April. And I, I just... I. CNN's highest rated show was Chris Cuomo Primetime. That averaged 917,000 viewers, and it finished 26th overall among cable news networks. 26th. Their highest rated show with Chris Cuomo, who I wouldn't watch if I were in prison, but he's on there. And he, they, they were 26th. That's their best, their best performance is 26th. So, Someone needs to explain that to me, how a network can survive. Not a network. The network's going to survive. But how do these people stay on the air? How is Wolf Blitzer still on the air every day? Nobody's watching him. Nobody's watching Don Lemon. They're not watching. They're tw they're, if, if 26th is the best, so where's Don Lemon? They don't have it here. Was he 36th? You know, I worked at KDK for a long time, worked at Channel 4. Um, you know, we looked at the ratings every day. If we would have seen a 26% drop in the ratings, we would have expected somebody to be fired. News director, general manager, somebody's got to go. I don't, um, I don't know. CNN has somehow survived. Maybe somebody can explain that to me. Um, I, just don't, I just don't get it. So maybe someone will figure that out and tell me. In the meantime, I think we have our guest. We do. Daniel Harsani. Daniel, you're there. I am David. David Harsani. Dave, I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. Okay. I've, I've been reading Close. about CNN and I'm all I'm confused. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, but but I appreciate you being here. I I wanted to uh, set it up a little bit. Uh, we were having trouble getting a hold of you there, but um, just to to mention again, the name of your book uh, that you just wrote is called uh, First Freedom: A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun, and um, uh, one of the reasons I thought of you uh, when I saw this, uh, saw your book, uh, so I, was, I was looking at something else online somewhere, and I, something popped up with your book on it. And I've been thinking about this as all this stuff has been going on in Venezuela. 
Um, uh, and, and I thought this is a pretty good lesson in why we have and still need the Second Amendment. And I know that's kind of part of the theme of your book anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. I mean, uh, you know, it's a, the right to defend yourself is a universal, you know, right that, that dates back in, in our culture and from England and, you know, our jurisprudence and all that dates back farther than the right to freedom of religion and farther than the right of freedom to speech. It's one of the core natural rights we have. We are allowed to defend ourselves, our property, our families. And it was an incredibly important part of the ideas that sort of girded together all the freedoms Buddy, that that the Second Amendment is is less about uh, self defense and hunting than it is about preventing tyranny and letting the government know that you're armed is a good idea. They'll say, well, what, you know, I don't care what your gun collection is. You can have a lot of AR-15s or AK-47s, whatever you want, but you're not going to stand a chance against the government. What do you say to people who give you that line? Well, I would say that first first part, you're completely correct. The argument for for gun ownership was all about uh, defending yourself from tyranny, the lo- local or, or your centralized government or whatever you have. More Less about your government and more about people who are trying to take your other rights away from you. So that is the reason for the Second Amendment, not hunting. No one was worried about not having a gun for hunting because it would have been uh, crazy for anyone to even believe that someone would take their guns away for that notion. And that's why the militia is mentioned in the Second Amendment as well. It's about fighting against tyranny, protecting your community, that sort of thing. Um, and it's true, we don't have tanks, but anyone who's ever seen you know, the news or read about history know very well that if lots of people have guns, they can defend themselves in guerrilla warfare and in other ways. It happens all over the place all the time. And it's kind of weird for an American to think about guns in that way because we're a million miles away from having, through all the fights we have and everything else, we're still very far away from any sort of, you know, revolutionary action, things like that, at least I hope so. So they can't imagine it. But uh, when you look at Venezuela right now, it would be a, you wouldn't be running over civilians if you knew that they could fight back and if they had weapons. You, you wouldn't be doing that. Someone was just arguing with me about um, the Holocaust. You know, I don't think that the Holocaust would have been prevented if Jews had guns, but it would have been a hell of a lot harder to round people up and put them on trains if you knew that when you opened a door, someone had a gun to protect themselves. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, I didn't think about this until just now you mentioned it, uh, the Jewish uh, situation uh, and the Holocaust. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Zookeeper's Wife. Have you ever heard of that movie? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and just there, uh, it's been a while since I saw it, but I remember leaving there thinking, boy, that was a great argument for the Second Amendment because there was a point in the movie where the, the, uh, the Jews were being just dragged away, and then all of a sudden uh, a few of them got some guns and things changed a little bit. And some people were saved because of it. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto is a good example of how difficult it is to deal with civilians who only had a few guns with them. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, my uh, grandfather died, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the Holocaust, and he was in Hungary. And in Hungary, uh, it's not that the SS didn't come in and take away Jews. Local authorities did that. And, you know, they took whole villages sometimes. So imagine them having to show up at a village when you have a bunch of people, a thousand people, who have guns. It's a very different situation. Again, I'm not saying, not victim blaming here. I'm not saying that it would have changed things maybe in the long run, but it would have been harder and it would have been, uh, maybe lives would have been saved. And also, you know, a few dead Nazis would have hurt. Either. Right, right. So, so how much difference do you think the picture would be in Venezuela, say, if 10 million of the 32 million people down there had guns? Instead, as a, in case everybody, in case people don't know, they their guns were outlawed about four or five years ago. Yeah, they, they almost every time you read about any sort of t- tyranny, whether it's right or left or any, you know, wherever on the, on the spectrum, one of the first things those governments do is take away the rights of private citizens to defend themselves, to have guns. So uh, I think it would be very different. Obviously, things can get uh, pretty crazy sometimes when you have all kinds of factions there. So it's, it's not just about the gun, it's about the people who have those guns. But I think that uh, I think it would be a lot harder for them to oppress folks and 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 drive, like I said, drive a car into a crowd of right. them if they knew that when they went home there were other people and their neighbors had guns as well. It's it's a it's a great equalizer in many ways. We're talking to David Harsani. He is the author of a book, First Freedom: A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. What made you want to write that book, uh, David? 
interesting. I think we always argue about guns um, and the politics of it and even the history of it. But it's, I don't, you know, and, and we, and I grew up in a place in New York where people didn't have guns. Well, criminals had guns, but normal people didn't really have guns. And I, I always uh, thought of gun culture as sort of crazy, but I never thought to think and write and really study why people treat the guns the way they do. Why do they care about them so much? Why do they care about the Second Amendment? And the history of it is just fascinating. So when I was looking for an accessible book that just dealt with the history of it that a normal person can read, I didn't find one, so I figured I'd write it myself. <laughs> That's a good idea. Is there, yeah. is, is there another country that has a history similar to ours when it comes to guns? Not really. I mean, a lot of this comes from England, and uh, right, you know, I my book covers sort of the invention of, of, of the gun itself in a way, but mostly it starts here in America. And uh, we brought these ideas with us, the people who first came here, uh, as because uh, they were fighting for religious freedom themselves, and they were fighting also to defend themselves from uh, other other factions and other people here. So uh, does anyone else have a history like that? England used to. The only country I would say that has a very strong kind of gun culture maybe is, you know, Switzerland uh, right now. But there's really no country that treats guns the way the, the Americans have because it's so such a big part of the creation of our country and such a big part of our move, expansion westward and such a big part of the way that we got our freedom and held our freedom that uh, I don't think any other country has a similar kind of relationship, at least not on a personal you know, level, individually. Did you find out a lot about guns that you didn't know that you didn't know? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of uh, the book. The book is not very political at all. I mean, I go into the debate today, but I was really surprised at how uh, big a part of gun culture in the sense of, you know, played in business and in manufacturing the early... Uh, industrial revolution was led by people like Sam Colt with interchangeable parts and things. It was a huge boost to the economy, and it was really just tons of interesting entrepreneurs and engineers working on different kind of guns, and Americans really led the way most of the time. And that history is really fascinating, um, all the way to John Browning, who you know was just a genius and invented many of the guns we basically use today. So uh, I, I never really realized how much uh, guns were sort of part of everyday culture not just in war or in, you know, in, in fights, but in actually just the way people lived. Hey, David, we only have about two minutes left. Unless you can stay off through the break, we were late getting you on, and I wanted, there's some other things I want to talk to you about. But if, sure, I'd be happy uh, to. Okay, so I, I, I have a hard break coming up here in about two minutes. I want to ask you something about the word regulated, okay, in, in the Second Amendment. Uh, I've, I've read a lot of history. I went through a period where I was reading uh, biographies of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, all, all the founders, and th I, the word regulated kept coming up in, in ways that I don't think most people know it was used back then. People think regulated means like uh, the way the, uh, the uh, FDA regulates drug sales. And I don't know if you came across this in your book, but the, the word regulated there meant um, the way they used it back then, as far as I could tell, and you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, and we'll talk about it more after the break, but I think it's a big deal because regulated to me, based on what I read, meant well-drilled, well-equipped. It had nothing to do with being regulated the way we think of the word regulation right now. I got about a minute before the break. I mean, I definitely agree with what you just said. It's hard to sort of drill down or find the exact uh, way they meant it, because uh, it, it was a long, drawn-out process that I go through in the book that they came to this language to try to help everyone else, you know, to help certain states join the union and so on. So it's hard to get it exactly, you know, to find that sentence where someone says that's what regulate meant. But yes, that's what regulate meant uh, in all other debates about the militia going back to the 1600s. So I think that your reading of history is correct. Well, good. We're going to be uh, right back with David Harsani. We'll take a break, uh, and we'll be right back here on AM 1250, The Answer. Stick around. With SRN News, I'm Keith Peters in Washington. President Trump says he and his administration are committed to protecting religious liberty. At a National Day of Prayer ceremony here at the White House, the president said we renew our resolve to protect communities of faith so that all people can live and pray and worship in peace. He denounced recent hate-filled attacks on churches, synagogues, and mosques. The president also declared that prayer works, and he quoted from the book of Isaiah. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint.
Greg Clugston, the White House. Baltimore's new mayor promises that Catherine Pugh's resignation will lead to a stronger Baltimore. After Pugh resigned as mayor Thursday afternoon, acting mayor Bernard Jack Young automatically became the permanent mayor. On Wall Street, the down by 122 points, the Nasdaq dropped 13, the S&P lower by 6. This is SRN News. The following is not an actor, but a real-life story from Trinity Debt Management. I had a lot of credit card debt, and I couldn't pay my bills. I was feeling so bad, I got to a point where I needed some help. So I reached out and contacted Trinity. If you're in debt and you need help, call Trinity at 1-800-990-6976 to talk to a certified counselor. They were able to take all of my different payments and put them all together. Trinity will consolidate your accounts into one easy easy to manage monthly payment, put a stop to late fees and over limit charges, reduce your interest and possibly improve your credit score. You'll save thousands. And they were actually able to work with my creditors. I've been able to pay off close to $15,000 in the last 18 months. If your debt has you down, call Trinity at 1-800-990-6976. My name is Stephanie and I'm debt free for keeps. 1-800-990-6976. Mike Gallagher says Joe Biden must not be reading the news. Everybody knows how great the economy is doing. You can't pretend it's not. People are actually taking home more money. It's the last thing. You'd go after anything but the economy, right? If you're Joe Biden, you'd go after anything but the economy. The middle class is hurting. It's hurting now. The Mike Gallagher Show, weekdays at 9, right before Dennis Prager at noon on AM 1250. The Answer. One in seven men is diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime. The good news? When caught early, it can be treated. The bad? All treatment options have side effects, like impotence, urinary leakage, and rectal bleeding. New Space Ore Hydrogel is FDA cleared and clinically proven to help. Men receiving Space Ore Hydrogel were more likely to maintain their normal sexual, urinary, and bowel functions. Visit spaceoar.org or ask your doctor about Space Ore Hydrogel. It's Better Together, the exciting daily half-hour talk show by women and for women. It's good friends like Lori Crouch, Christine Kane, Carrie Job, Victoria Osteen, Lisa Harper, and many more. It's more than just a TV show. It's your daily destination for love, friendship, encouragement, and community. It's Better Together, 130 Eastern, 1030 Pacific, only on TBN. Text TOGETHER to 316316 to join in. That's TOGETHER to 316316. We'll see you real soon. Have you ever seen a pest controller spraying chemicals in your home? It makes you wonder, if their chemicals are safe, then why do they suit up and wear respirators only to leave you to walk back in unprotected? G'day, I'm Scott from Plug In Pest Free, and I'm here to tell you there's a better way. In an age where we now have the choice to drive electric cars, you too can electronically rid your home or business of unwanted rodents and pests. The answer is Plug In Pest Free. 100% chemical-free, Plug-in Pest-Free is your safest bet for your family and pets. Our bestseller, the Plug-in Pest-Free Pro, will cover up to 4,000 square feet. Now that's fair dinkum. So order yours today at gopestfree.com. Use promo code SAVE20 for 20% off plus free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's gopestfree.com, promo code SAVE20. Don't spray and regret, plug in and forget. Go pestfree.com today. Stuck in traffic? We've got the answer. Being delays on outbound 28, a lot of volume there. Veterans Bridge to the Highland Park Bridge. Now on northbound 79, you'll slow down from the Parkway North up to 910. And you're all stacked up Parkway East outbound Boulevard of the Allies to Edgewood Swissvale. On the inbound side, Edgewood Swissvale to the Squirrel Hill Tunnel, a little bit slow through there. Parkway West, heavy outbound from 79 to Campbell's Traffic. I'm Jenny Robinson. AM 1250, the answer, weather. Skies will turn out mostly cloudy tonight. There'll be a couple of showers around along with a thunderstorm, low 60 degrees. Tomorrow, rather cloudy with a few showers. There can be a thunderstorm in the afternoon, high 72. A shower or thunderstorm around through the early part of tomorrow night, low 51. Then for Saturday, cooler with periods of rain in the afternoon, Saturday's high 65 degrees. With Iraqi weather forecast, I'm Danielle Niddle. This is the John Stackerwalt Show on AM 1250 and FM 92.5. The answer. 
We're back with David Harsani. He's the author of a book, First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. We were talking about the word regulated uh, just before the break, and I don't want to beat it to death, but I, I think it's an important thing, uh, David, because it's that word and the word militia that goes with it that people who want to deny the fa- the idea that uh, the Second Amendment uh, allows for personal uh, use of, you know, personal arms um, possession, uh, they like that that's the word that they they hang their hat on. And um, I mean, I can remember seeing uh, I'd read a book about John Paul Jones, and he he um, was talking about seeing the Russian Navy. He, when he was he was somewhere observing the Russian Navy, and he said that they they operated with great regularity. And what he meant by that was that they had the regulation equipment. They were well drilled. It had nothing to do with the government coming in and regulating individual people. So uh, why is it that uh, that the um, the people who would like to reduce the um, rights that go with the uh, Second Amendment like to use that word, and they they don't. The, do you think they know that it was u- that it was used that way when the when the when the document was written? Well, I mean, some do and some don't, you know, and they were convinced of it. But I, I'm I'm happy you brought this up actually because the, the regulating part of the militia, the militia, had a, an incredibly long history in, in American life, going back hundreds of years into English times as well, where they were militias as well. So those were sometimes you had to be a young men were regulated to go and be part of this militia, actually even in middle-aged men, and they were had to be well-regulated, meaning well-trained, so that they wouldn't, uh, you know, if something happened, they would actually be able to react to it. More than that, every militia, or most militias actually, people brought their own weapons to the militia. That's why the Second Amendment is written the way it is. People had their own weapons. It's not as if the government handed them a weapon and took it back after they were trained. Right. They brought their own muskets. Uh, in, you couldn't have a militia if individuals didn't have weapons. So um, I go through this in the book. I mean, the, the, the militia, the history of militias going to the Minutemen is, is really incredibly interesting and uh, has a lot to do with early American history because people were three thousand, you know, thousands of miles away from their government in England, even a thousand miles maybe away from their government in the United States or hundreds of miles away. They yeah. had to protect themselves. Yeah. So um, I, I had one last thing on that that I read that I, re- I remember was um, – um, I was reading a, a biography of James Madison, and some, uh, there was a letter that someone had written, uh, a woman had written a letter to her friend describing a dinner put on by Dolly Madison. And this has always stuck with me. And she used the word, it was well-regulated. And I, and, and I couldn't believe it when I saw it. But she was ta- I'm guessing she was talking about, you know, where each fork was supposed to go, and it was, it was served with, you know, precision and timeliness and all that stuff. But the, her dinners were well-regulated. And that, so that's, where, that's the use of the word. So I laugh every time I, I hear someone try to deny the, uh, the idea of uh, personal ownership of a gun because of the world word regulated in the, in the Second Amendment. Um, so, so is there any doubt? Uh, after your research, that the founders saw the right to bear arms as a check on tyranny? No, not at all. I mean, there's not a single there's not a single person who was involved in the debates over the Constitution who came out against personal firearm ownership. There's not the, the reason. There were many states or a few states that wanted it included in the Bill of Rights or they or as a prerequisite to being part of the the Union. You know, so um, in their own state constitutions. Uh, it, you know, they have the right to bear arms as well. And moreover, there are tons and tons and tons of quotes of of uh, founders and, and people who were part of the process treating the gun ownership as a given. You know, it's not; it wasn't even up for debate. There's not a single founder that argued against individual gun ownership. There isn't one. But uh, I guess the, the people who would who would dis- dispute the um, right to bear arms for an individual. And and also uh, think that the government should have a lot of power to regulate what kind of guns they can have. Would say that, yeah, you're allowed to have a uh, a gun, but uh, it's it, it's not it, it's for self it's for self defense, and that doesn't mean that you're allowed to have an AR-15. So how would the founders, based on your readings, react to that argument? Well, well, there's a you know there's a simple argument to give give them, which is you know 
it, it would be the same way as arguing that the First Amendment should only be uh, should only cover writing on parchment paper and, and yeah. sending out, you know, right. leaflets, whereas, uh, you, know, the, you, you know, you can't expand it. I mean, it's ridiculous. The founders were not stupid people. They understood technology. In fact, the, the, for instance, they knew of the Kentucky rifle, which could fire 300 yards instead of 50 with great accuracy. And they had other guns, which I write about, that had been invented that were almost like automatic weapons in a way, air guns, things of that nature. They knew about these things. They knew there would be an expansion. which I've saved because uh, I, I really liked it. But his take was that the Second Amendment is nothing to do with self-defense, nothing to do with hunting, and it's the right to kill tyrants. Is that a little too <laughs> radical? No, I mean, I, I think that that is the main reason, yeah. I mean, you know, when I say individual defense, I'm talking about the defense of individual rights. I think part uh -huh. of that is property, your home. I mean... You know, even the Third Amendment says you can't come into my house, you know, and just put people to sleep here. I think, you know, that all works and, and binds together. I mean, he's a legal scholar, so he knows more about it than I do. But I definitely think killing tyrants is part of the Second Amendment, or maybe the whole, maybe a big part of it or the biggest part of it. Okay, so now, and again, you're not a legal scholar, and obviously I'm not, uh, but my question has been for a while here. Um, why did we go so long with uncertainty about the individual right to bear arms? Um, Heller versus the District of Columbia was only about ten and a half years ago. So, if you know what you, what your research shows you is that the founders believed that this is what the Second Amendment was for was individual right to bear arms. But it took a, a, a Supreme Court uh, ruling only ten and a half years ago to reconfirm that. What happened in between? Absolutely. That's a great question. And. Uh, you know, for many years it never came up because the, to challenge the right of individual gun ownership was absurd. No one would have even thought to do it. It wasn't until the 1930s when you had, um, you know, uh, the people. Uh, now I should quickly just take a step back. There were some cities like New York in the early uh, 1900s, and also southern states in the late after the Civil War, who used gun, um, who came up with gun restrictions to, to as basically they were racist laws or laws to undermine uh, certain people like you know in New York and things like that but there was never a national law for gun registration until uh, gun restrictions until the 1930s when in Chicago and other places people were sort of gallivanting around the countryside with it you know with uh, Tommy machine guns, guns yeah. like that <laughs> yeah so you know Bonnie and Clyde used the bar you know military grade machine guns to rob places so um they came up with laws then, but even then, I don't know if people realize, it wasn't until 1986 that fully automatic weapons, machine guns, were banned. Um, they were rarely really used in criminal activity, and, uh, you know, the FDR administration, you know, used the, the, the crime scare, and I'm not saying it wasn't completely legitimate, but, you know, it was overdone to, uh, to institute the first, you know, federal firearm laws. So, so we went from that and, until... Uh, 2008, yeah. when they had when when it was I, I'm not sure I think it was a five to four decision, the Heller yeah. decision. Otherwise, where would we be if that would have been five to four the other way? Right. So it's starting in the 30s, uh, you know, you had judges coming up with the you know theory of uh, collective right, you know, the gun ownership yeah. was a collective right, militia, all that stuff. Yeah. So it wasn't until Heller that uh, the court finally said that it was an individual right. And, uh, you know, really wasn't many. There, there were very few gun cases. That's the truth. There was one, the Miller case, and then um, there was another one or two cases. But it, it was not something that had gone to the Supreme Court very often. So the Heller case was excellent because it, uh, it, was, it started with, in, with other cases of, of minorities and others in Washington, D.C., wanting to defend them, their, their home and property from, from criminality. So to, I, I just thought it, it was sort of the perfect case for the court to really codify the First Amendment. And I'm, I'm wondering what, I mean, it was a five to four decision. So there were four uh, legal scholars who were scholarly enough to have become Supreme Court justices who thought that the... Second Amendment did not give those people in Washington the right to own uh, to to own their own guns, and to, right. to, to I mean they had to block them in a box. I mean, it was some the law was unbelievably stupid. Yeah, yeah, oh my God. I mean, it, you know what's sad though, in a way, is that really it's still almost impossible to get a gun around here if you live in Maryland or or, or DC. Really? Yeah, it's the, there are so many laws. I mean, I find them unconstitutional. I think the laws in Maryland, for instance, are just <clears> difficult. 
you shouldn't have so many barriers. I always say this. I think we should tie gun laws to voting voting rights. Each should be just as easy as the other one because both are protected by the Constitution, right? So um, getting a gun here is so difficult. There's so many barriers that uh, it undermines the the ability of people to 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 practice their you know to to engage in their rightful uh, you know the constitutional right to have a gun. It's just amazing. Yeah. Finishing up here with David Harsani. He's the uh, author of a book called First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. I'm I, I just wondering, I, mean, I don't know how, I didn't get a chance to read your book because I just sort of found out about it yesterday, but um, it, it, the, the gunslinger, did you do anything with the gunslingers uh, and, the, and the Wild West and, you know, the Wild oh, Bill yeah. Hickox and all those guys? Oh, yeah, I did a ton. I mean, uh, I... I it was just so fascinating, that whole world. It's kind of like our folklore, you know. And uh, what was interested me most, I guess i just throw out a little tidbit here, is that, you know, we have probably seen thousand times over more gunfighting in movies than actually happened, you know, in the real right. world. There was, when everyone has a gun, uh, people are not as uh, inclined to reach for it, <laughs> right. you know, when they know the other guy has one, too. Right. Uh, a lot of those people that are sort of portrayed as heroes were really just cold-blooded murderers. They weren't standing out, you know, in the middle of the uh, street, yeah. you know, fighting. They were shooting people in the back, things like that. But, oh, really? Yeah, crime was pretty rare, you know, in general. Though there were. There were gunslingers. Some of them, I think, are just psych- psychos, right? I mean, you know, they were doing things that were really psychotic. But it's just a very interesting and fun history. And I, I try to debunk a lot of myths about the the West. I think it was actually a lot better place than people, or a lot less violent place than people think. So there weren't gunfights in the street in Dodge City every day? Occasionally, occasionally. But I think, I'm not sure 100% about this number, but I think that's close. I think Dodge City averaged about 1.5 murders a year over the gunslinging year, so it was a very low number. That's not to say that it didn't happen outside of town or people weren't killing each other. But one of the range wars that, uh, that were covered, you know, in the, in the uh, in the east, you know, in the newspapers, yeah. had had one had one death. I forget what the name of which range war. It wasn't really a war as much as, you know, a murder. One well, murder. I find that kind of disappointing, David. That Dodge <laughs> City only had one murder a year. What the hell were they doing oh, over there? One point five. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I uh, don't know. We're, so Matt Dillon and uh, and you know what he did an easy job. <laughs> It was a, you know, everyone has guns. No, you know, people are, and also a lot of the, you know, a lot of the killers were hung, so they didn't stick around to, you know, c- publicly in their business. Yeah, exactly. It was probably a bit scary. That worked as might have worked as a kind of a deterrent. Hey, uh, uh, David, I really appreciate it. it. Sounds like a really interesting book. I could probably talk to you a lot longer about it. Uh, I really like the gunslinger stuff, even though I damn disappointed about Dodge City. That uh, yeah, there's some good stuff there, though. There were some gunfights, and some of those guys were pretty amazing. To what, be honest. what about the they OK got- Corral? Yeah, you know, I, I don't. I think that that's a that was a rarity. But okay. uh, Hick, Hickok and stuff like that, they're amazing uh, guys, and uh, and they really knew how to sort of blow up their own mythology. And and uh, you know, I, I like those stories. I, I think you'd find it interesting. But it probably wasn't a good idea to mess with Wild Bill Hickok, is what you're saying. Now he was uh, actually one of the guys you didn't want to mess with. That's <laughs> definitely correct. Okay. He was, uh, he was legitimately great with a gun, and also later Annie Oakley, people like that. They were just amazing folks. Wow, that's great. That sounds like a really uh, good book. It's titled First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. Thanks, David. Thank you. All right, and we'll be right back. Have you heard the crack of the bat, the cheers of the crowd? Have you seen the smiles on the faces of the players as they take the field? I'm not talking about the Pirates. I'm talking about what's happening in Moon Township that can only be described as a miracle. This is John Steigerwald. With the help of Pirates Charities and people like yourself, the Miracle League of Moon Township has broken ground on a brand new ball field and adaptive playground where athletes with special needs can play regardless of their ability. At miraclesmoon.org, you can see the stunning plans for the 9,500 square foot playground and state-of-the-art ADA compliant restroom facility with showers, wave technology, multi-level fountains and sinks, mechanical changing tables and more. It's incredible. Our goal? To raise the remaining funds they need to bring it home by first pitch this September. Check it out at miraclesinmoon.org slash donate and make your tax-deductible gift today. That's miraclesinmoon.org slash donate. This message paid for by Robinson Town Center, a Zamias Properties entity. Are you about to pay double for roof replacement or repair? 
If you haven't called Windows or Us, you just might. Many companies are overcharging area homes and businesses nearly double with over 50 years in home remodeling. Windows R Us is more than a window company. They're the area's premier exterior replacement company for siding, doors, gutters, downspouts, and roof replacement and repair. Factory certified by North America's largest roof manufacturer, Windows R Us will never overcharge. You'll love their no-pressure sales approach, straightforward pricing, and the fastest turnaround in the business. Right now, get zero interest for 12 months on up to 20 thousand dollars windows or us will match any competitor's price no hidden fees or surprises ever schedule a free roof inspection today mention am 1250 for an exclusive 10 percent off why pay double visit the area's premier exterior replacement company windows or us more than a window company visit windows or us pittsburgh.com Hey there, gun lovers. Here's an exciting opportunity to celebrate your Second Amendment freedoms at the number one destination for American gun owners. It only happens once a year, so don't miss out. This is your chance to claim your discounted tickets to the Concealed Carry Expo coming to Pittsburgh the weekend of May 17th through the 19th. It'll be an action-packed three-day event at the David Lawrence Convention Center you don't want to miss. Text EXPO to the number 87222 right now to lock in your discounted tickets and to learn more. It's that easy, and you'll get exclusive access to check out new guns and gear, a free live fire range, reality-based training simulator, training, and much, much more. Plus, if you register right now, you'll also get your free responsibly armed American t-shirt made by Nine Line Apparel. It's a high-quality shirt with a limited edition design. But that ends very soon. Don't get left behind. Hurry and text EXPO to the number 87222 to get your tickets now. That's the word EXPO to the number 87222. Hi, it's Hugh Hewitt for PatriotMobile.com, the country's only conservative cell phone carrier. Do you believe in abortion? Do you want sanctuary cities? And if not, why are you supporting these efforts with your cell phone? Big Mobile has given millions of dollars of your money to these causes when you pay your cell phone bill. That's why conservatives created Patriot Mobile, to give you a choice to stop supporting things you don't believe in. It's easy to switch to Patriot Mobile. You get the same reliable nationwide service, unlimited talk and text, plans starting as low as $25, and each bill you pay supports your values. Need more motivation? Mention Hugh Hewitt when you call 1-800-A-PATRIOT or visit them online at patriotmobile.com forward slash Hugh to get your activation fee waived. In fact, for two lines, you can make a difference, but only if you make the switch to Patriot Mobile. Call 1-800-A-PATRIOT or visit patriotmobile.com forward slash Hugh. Warning, listening to this program may expose you to toxic masculinity. The John Steigerwald Show on AM 1250. The answer. So I want to, before we go here, I got a few minutes. I want to say uh, hello and thanks to Alice in Glassport. I found out today through my brother Paul, who ran into her out on the uh, out on the road today, uh, that Alice saw Paul and said, "Are you are you Paul? And are you related to John?" He said, "Yeah." Well, I listen to his show every day, and she also rescues labs, so that's a good thing. So hi, Alice in Glassport. Paul wanted me to make sure I said hello to you, so I did. And uh, thanks for listening. She says she listens every day. So at least somebody's out there. I know I'm talking to Alice every day. So um, <clears throat> speaking of um, uh, what <laughs> this is, this is just <clears throat> we, toxic masculinity. Uh, you know, there's a, what, what people consider toxic masculinity is one thing. I, I think this might be actually more toxic. Drag queen story hour. These are, these are men. Uh, and we had this story on before. This is the Houston Public Library thought that it would be a good idea. Two things here. The Houston Public Library thought it would be a good idea to invite drag queens in to read stories to little kids. And I'm looking at a picture here, and these kids look to be, they're toddlers. They're, they're kindergarten or younger. And they thought it would be really nice to have uh, these um, Drag queens come in and read stories to the little kids. Uh, they already had one guy convicted of multiple sexual assaults. Uh, or I'm sorry, as a uh, he was a sex offender. But <clears throat> there's a new one now. The uh, the Houston mass resistance activists have exposed a second drag queen from this group from the library. So two of them. This man was convicted of multiple sexual assaults against four young children ages four, five, six, and eight 
in 2004. He was incarcerated and is listed as a high-risk sex offender. The Houston Public Library invited this guy to come and dress as a, well, you know, she's a woman. It's a woman, drag queen, for Drag Queen Story Hour. Uh, and, and the man had worked as a transgender prostitute and a porn actor. And uh, according to their website, the Space City Sisters is a local chapter of National Organization of Cross-Dressing Homosexual Men. That's what this uh, lovely guy uh, belonged to. The men dress as parodies of Catholic nuns in order to mock Catholicism. And the Houston Library thought it would be a good idea of all the people you could have to come in and read to kids, you know, a fireman, a policeman, an Indian chief, I don't know. Let's bring in a sex offender, dress him up in women's clothes, even though he has a beard, and see if we can confuse the kids enough by having this uh, despicable human being read stories. Uh, library officials later apologized for failing to conduct a background check. You wouldn't want to check these guys, a background on these guys. Here, how about this? How about apologizing for having drag queens reading to four- and five-year-olds in the first place? But you know what's worse than this? And uh, as I pointed out the last time we had to talk about this, uh, these idiots, what's even worse than this? these people showing up to read are the parents who brought their kids to the library knowing that the purpose of their visit was to be read to by a drag queen. What's a four-year-old kid supposed to get out of that? Well, there you go. That's life in America in 2019. Make sure you vote for these people who believe in this kind of stuff and have them control your life. Talk to you tomorrow. John Steigerwall Show is a production of AM 1250, The Answer, and Salem Media Group. One in seven men is diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime. The good news? When caught early, it can be treated. The bad? All treatment options have side effects, like impotence, urinary